I'm going to introduce Dr. Carlos Jose Rodriguez, um, and he has a, a lengthy bio that is also in your um, brochure, but he is professor tenured and vice chair for academic affairs, division of cardiovascular medicine, director of clinical cardiovascular research at Albert Einstein College of Medicine. Now, for any of you who don't know, Albert Einstein is a pretty highly thought of um, organization, and I'm going to let him talk about the work because you're doing, are you the only Latino, God, come on up, there's something about that background um, that he has to share. Um, it, it's so important for us to look at all of the different kinds of population issues that exist for everyone because they affect one another, okay? So we're moving on to talking about your population, but um, I think we should just keep in mind that we've been talking about a variety of populations, all of whom have issues around how do they get represented, how are they presented in the research, et cetera. And the last thing I'm going to say is just in reference to what Dr. Salafu spoke of, and he knows this is my perspective. If we do not use our voices in appropriate ways where we know they can have impact, nothing will happen. So the only reason that Cuomo thought about doing anything, even though it was not necessarily optimal, is because people were pressuring him. And the people who were pressuring him were the people that you should be speaking to, your elected officials, et cetera, et cetera. And I mean, I'm not going to go further on that, but if you don't get represented there and if we don't make sure our populations get represented there and vote, nothing's going to happen. Mm. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So yeah. Um, I hold all those titles, just, just titles, that's all. Um, but I am at, at Albert Einstein. Um, only been there for four months. I am the only one uh, there that grew up in, um, in Washington Heights, in, in uh, the Bronx, Upper Manhattan. Um, you know, used to travel back and forth from the neighborhood. So very familiar with the population, the problems, the issues, all the things that, that we talk about um, and care about. Um, I, I also want to uh, say that uh, the last presentation was so thought-provoking and great. Um, I'm glad I got to, to hear um, a good part of it, and I agree wholeheartedly with the, with the notion. I do think that there are some problems, there are some, some, some things uh, that um, bear debate and discussion, but I think the overall notion that we need, we need to find a way to um, simplify our health, health system and reduce health disparities is paramount, it's key. And um, I'm gonna be focusing on cardiovascular disparities. And while I do uh, talk about the Hispanic population, I'm Latino, I'm from the Dominican Republic, uh, I'm an immigrant who came to the US at age seven. Um, even though um, I'm from a, a Latino background, um, I think the issues overlap between blacks and Hispanics very much. That's, like I said, where I grew up, in Washington Heights and in the Bronx, you know, the two communities, black and Hispanic, um, live uh, sharing the same types of limitations and social determinants uh, uh, of health and um, uh, issues with care. So some of what I'll, what I'll talk about, um, even though I do uh, bear some data on the Hispanic population, I really talk about more about uh, blacks and Hispanics as an underrepresented group in medicine. So I'm a cardiologist, so with the focus being on cardiovascular disparities, um, I always start out with a slide. Um, it's already been mentioned um, how uh, cardiovascular disease is the leading cause of mortality in the United States, right? Um, it beats out cancer, everything else. It is um, so important. Um, as, a, as a cause of mortality, more than 2,000 people die every day from cardiovascular disease. And cardiovascular disease is very varied. 
I mean, we kind of think about it mostly as coronary disease or heart attack, but there's also heart failures, there's cardiac arrhythmias, there's cardiomyopathies, there's, it, there's a whole spectrum. Um, but um, in, in, as, a, as a totality, um, um, more than 2,000 people every day in the United States die from cardiovascular disease. Um, over the last um, few decades, we have made strides uh, to reduce the cardiovascular disease mortality rate. Um, as you can see this slide, um, the figure is showing you over time the rates, the cardiovascular mortality rates over time. And uh, they were increasing for quite, quite a while. Now, um, from like uh, 1979 to 2014, we made strides in bringing down the rate. And actually, the biggest um, uh, strides that we made were from the period of about 2000 to 2014. So um, not uh, inconsequentially, that fell about with the advent of things like stents, statins, things that were widely um, um, propagated in the, in the population for cardiovascular treatment and prevention. Um, most, most of the, the headways that we made were with secondary treatment, secondary prevention, I should say. Um, um, so, so we are very proud as cardiologists um, and, and the whole um, health community to be able to have declines in cardiovascular mortality rates. Um, however, uh, from 2014 to 15, we started seeing an uptick in cardiovascular disease uh, mortality, uh, where the trend that had been going down uh, for some time started to kind of tick back up. And um, now, with the most recent data, uh, it's showing at least that it's not necessarily going up, but it is plateauing. So obviously, with um, cardiovascular disease, which is such a prominent cause of death, we'd like to see the trend continue to go down. Seeing it either go back up or plateau is a sign for alarm. And I would, I would argue, uh, from my opinion, that um, part of the reason why um, we're kind of hitting a plateau now, and a lot of people are asking why this is, is because cardiovascular disease disparities are really not being addressed. There's a lot, there's a, there's a huge gap still left in addressing those disparities. And until we can improve the health care um, of everybody in the United States, we cannot get to a point where we can see, um, I mean, this, we're going to plateau. We're not going to get to a point where we can see the rates really go as far, as far down as we can go. And I'll, and I'll talk more about that. So to that point, we all know that the um, um, population in the United States is very diverse. Um, there's 48% um, of the U.S. population is non-white, and 30% of the U.S. population is, is black or Hispanic. And um, I think, so, so the majority of the non-white population is um, African American or, or, or Latino. And I think that that's important because when you look at the healthcare community, um, about 6% of physicians are uh, black or Hispanic. So you have a wide gap of underrepresentation in the um, uh, healthcare uh, physician community of, of uh, providers, uh, given the, the proportion of um, blacks and Hispanics that there are. So that's why, that's why uh, we still uh, are a very underrepresented uh, racial and ethnic uh, group as a whole. And in the past, I think when it comes to cardiovascular data, it's been okay to extrapolate from data, cardiovascular data from uh, predominantly white cohorts such as Framingham uh, data and try to extrapolate that to everybody. But obviously the notion that we've all come to um, is that that's not really right. You can't just take white data and, and superimpose it on um, African American or Latino communities. There are differences and differences that we appreciate that I'll go into. And actually the research, the cardiovascular research, should really reflect the U.S. population that's being studied. So we can't have all this cardiovascular data, cardiovascular clinical trials that's only predominantly on uh, European or Caucasian populations. Because obviously the public health impact of addressing um, uh, the health of um, underrepresented minorities or the non-white population in the United States is huge. Um, there's a huge, just by the numbers, 
there's a huge public health Im impact there if we, if we start focusing more on this population. So um, to that point, um, I mentioned that cardiovascular disease mortality has gone down um, over time. Um, and again, we're, we were uh, very happy about that until we started seeing the plateau. But, but what has persisted, even when we were seeing these dramatic declines in cardiovascular disease mortality, is that there was still a gap. There was still a huge um, disparity gap where certain racial and ethnic groups remained with higher cardiovascular uh, disease mortality um, uh, compared to other groups. Uh, despite, even though everybody's uh, uh, mortality was going down, certain groups still remained um, uh, with very high levels. And when you look at um, the, the proportion of ideal cardiovascular health, it really does bear out a disparity where you see ideal cardiovascular health in 40% of whites, but only 15% of African Americans. And again, this is national uh, data from national uh, population-based cohorts. And, and you see it in uh, ideal cardiovascular health in 25% of Mexican Americans. And I would, I would argue that that's probably even overestimated when it comes to Latinos, because some of the, the data that I'll, I'll show, I mean, Mexican Americans are probably the healthiest of Latino subgroups. Um, and unfortunately, that's really the only data that the US was collecting when it comes to the Hispanic population. So I really think that um, the prevalence of ideal cardiovascular health is even lower than what you see there when it comes to the Hispanic population in general. And that's important because ideal cardiovascular health is one of the most important predictors of future cardiovascular disease, mortality, and morbidity. So um, let me go into some cardiac risk factors, cardiovascular risk factors. Um, when we talk about hypertension, um, there are race ethnic differences, uh, some, some, some of which uh, um, we know about, uh, people in this room know about already. This is uh, US census data, um, US data that uh, shows different hypertension rates uh, among different race ethnic groups in the United States. And the bars in the middle show that uh, you can see that hypertension uh, rates are higher for African Americans compared to other race ethnic groups in the United States. And the higher prevalence of hypertension among African Americans is coupled with um, a worse severity uh, of disease. What you see is um, African Americans presenting at a younger age with high blood pressure and presenting with higher average blood pressure than uh, non-Hispanic whites. You see that in the advanced hypertension category, you see a, a greater representation of African Americans compared to whites. And um, as a result of that, there's a, you see a more sequela of hypertensive uh, disease in African Americans where they have a greater uh, rate of, of strokes, be it fatal or non-fatal, and greater rates of congestive heart failure and kidney disease. Diabetes is something that for uh, cardiologists, we, we consider it um, what's called a coronary heart disease equivalent. And what that means, and, and this was borne out by these epidemiologic studies um, um, from uh, uh, some time ago, is that if you have diabetes um, and you've never had a heart attack, you have the same um, risk of, having, uh, of dying from cardiovascular disease as somebody who has never had diabetes but has had a prior, a prior heart attack. So we consider diabetes to be a cardiovascular heart disease equivalent and definitely something that um, um, bears importance in how can we reduce cardiovascular risk among diabetics. Now there are disparities here where the diabetes prevalence is higher among um, African Americans and Latinos. Uh, African Americans have twice uh, the rate of total uh, diabetes. That includes diagnosed and um, undiagnosed diabetes compared to, compared to whites. And uh, Mexican Americans uh, have 35% higher prevalence of total diabetes compared to whites. Uh, metabolic syndrome is another important cardiovascular concept. This is a concept that looks at a constellation of risk factors um, as shown here. And even if you have low levels of these risk factors, by low levels I mean that they may not be at the level of necessarily clinical treatment, but they're still, like you may have prediabetes, uh, 
um, or prehypertension and so forth. But still, just having even low levels of these risk factors when they come in as a constellation, um, this is known as the metabolic syndrome, and it pretends a higher coronary heart disease and mortality risk, as shown uh, by the figure. And there's also race-ethnic differences in the metabolic syndrome where we see higher prevalences uh, among Hispanics compared to any other race-ethnic group, um, specifically uh, the highest prevalence among uh, Latino women. Now, dyslipidemia, or abnormal blood cholesterol, also varies by race ethnicity. Uh, this is data uh, study that we did in northern Manhattan in Washington Heights, looking at a triethnic population of non-Hispanic uh, whites, non-Hispanic blacks, and Hispanics. We saw that rates of abnormal uh, uh, lipids uh, differed depending on race ethnicity. We saw that uh, African Americans had higher HDL lower triglycerides compared to other groups. Hispanics had lower HDL, higher triglycerides than other groups. Now, what was important is that if you just look, and this is, uh, I'm, I'm focusing on the Hispanic um, um, bars here, which is the, uh, um, the uh, looking at Hispanic and non-Hispanic white bars, the blue and the white. Uh, you can see that um, if you just look at LDL, which is your bad cholesterol, Hispanics don't appear to be different when it comes to rates of abnormal bad cholesterol. However, because of this mixed dyslipidemia, because of this race ethnic difference in abnormal lipids, Hispanics actually have higher cardiovascular risk. This, this was what we saw in northern Manhattan was also seen in this national study called the IRIS study. They saw more mixed dyslipidemia among Hispanics compared to non-Hispanic whites and African Americans. That portends a smaller and more dense LDL molecule. What that does, having a smaller and more dense LDL molecule makes it more atherogenic. That means that it's more likely to go from your bloodstream into the actual artery wall and form a plaque. The plaque is eventually what ends up blocking blood flow and causing the heart attack or stroke. So the fact, my point here is that if you only look at LDL alone, you may underestimate the cardiovascular risk among Hispanics. So we can't necessarily um, paint everybody with one brush. We have to look beyond, you know, below the surface and uncover these layers of, of difference that may make um, um, the Latino population more at risk despite similar uh, levels of bad cholesterol. Um, this, this is a slide uh, focusing on dietary variations and race ethnic differences. This is important, um, particularly in the uh, African American community where it's been studied the most, and I present uh, the data, um, but this, this uh, I'm sure would apply to um, um, some black and Latino communities as well. Um, this, this data showed that uh, there's basically a direct relationship between sodium intake and high blood pressure. And it's been shown, and it's shown here, corroborated uh, by other studies, that uh, blacks have higher sodium uh, dietary intake uh, than whites. And that's particularly prevalent in low socioeconomic uh, um, populations. And, and that's shown very clearly in this state. It's been corroborated uh, by other groups. But it's important because, and I'll, and I'll bear this out in other slides, there's more um, sodium sensitive high blood pressure among uh, African Americans. And if you look at population health strategies, uh, where the, what we call the um, population attributable risk of diseases, if you, if you focus on hypertension uh, among African American communities, um, there's, a, there's, a, there's a huge impact that can be made with regards to uh, um, lowering hypertension and the sequela that it, that it pretends. Um, in, this, in this slide, uh, I want to bring out LV, LVH, which is left ventricular hypertrophy. Frequently, it is a consequence of hypertension, but sometimes it's not. But the point is, whether it comes in the face of clinical hypertension or not, it portends a high uh, risk for cardiovascular disease and total mortality. Uh, what's shown in the graph 
here, and this is data that was initially borne out in Framingham, is if you go from the lowest quartile of left ventricular mass to the highest quartile, you actually increase your risk uh, for cardiovascular mortality by three to four times. So having left ventricular, uh, increased left ventricular mass and left ventricular hypertrophy is a strong cardiovascular risk factor. What we've, what we've seen, what's been shown over and over again, is that um, blacks have increased prevalence of left ventricular hypertrophy. Whether you look at it by electrocardiogram or you look at it by echocardiography. Um, this has been shown for, for decades. And um, recently, uh, we looked at a population again in northern Manhattan to see whether Hispanics also had a higher prevalence of left ventricular mass, increased left ventricular mass. And indeed, that's what the graph shows is that when you look at left ventricular mass um, on, among non-Hispanic blacks, Hispanics and non-Hispanic whites, you can see Hispanics, the purple bar falling somewhere in the middle, but definitely significantly higher um, left ventricular mass than uh, non-Hispanic whites. And, and Hispanics fall very similar to uh, non-Hispanic blacks. And this has been corroborated in, in other studies uh, shown here. So there's also, when it comes to cardiac disease, differences in, in heart failure. And it's been shown that there's a unique epidemiology of heart failure among African Americans. African Americans actually <coughs> have heart failure that seems to be more attributable uh, to hypertension than to epicardial coronary disease. And this is something that was important because before we actually looked at the data and realized the, that race ethnic difference, we were extrapolating what was seen in the white community where heart failure is more attributable, attributable to coronary disease. It was being highly um, extrapolated to African American and my, other minority communities. But in, in actuality, um, this epidemiology that's unique uh, with heart failure in African American uh, again emphasizes the point that addressing hypertension at a public health level or population health level can have a huge impact uh, in this community. So um, with regards to more um, epidemiology with, with heart failure among uh, underrepresented racial and ethnic groups, you see from the slides that there's a worse prognosis that heart failure bears when it comes to Hispanics and African Americans. Both present with heart failure at an earlier age. Both blacks and Hispanics um, uh, present with worse left ventricular dysfunction at the time of diagnosis. Both African Americans and Hispanics have higher rates of heart failure, hospitalizations, and readmissions. So it portends a worse prognosis. And in Hispanics um, specifically, there's data showing that Hispanics are less likely to receive target doses of heart failure, guideline-directed medical therapy, less likely than non-Hispanic blacks or non-Hispanic whites. And that's data from the Get With the Guidelines program. So this is data on um, total US population cardiovascular disease mortality. And this is broken down by different race ethnic groups. And the point here, I mean, if you look at the red bars, that represents the um, black community, you can see that they have extremely high rates of cardiovascular uh, mortality compared to other groups. Now, what's surprising from this graph is the yellow bars. The yellow bars show lower cardiovascular mortality among Hispanics. Um, and that's where either you look at heart disease or ischemic heart disease and to a certain degree stroke as well. So this is really um, paradoxical. It's really dis a disconnect because um, there's a lot of risk factors, cardiovascular risk factors that I just pointed out in the Hispanic community. Um, but the prior data has suggested for some time that maybe there's some type of health advantage among the Latino community. Um, that maybe compared to non compared to other 
racial and ethnic groups, Hispanics have some type of health advantage where you see a lower uh, mortality rate and cardiovascular mortality rate among Hispanic despite the higher cardiovascular risk factor burden and worse socioeconomic disadvantage that's seen. So this type of thing has been labeled the uh, Hispanic paradox. And it's, it's, there's really uh, some controversy around that, as you can imagine. And I think, in, in my opinion and in others, it's a flawed concept uh, for many reasons because um, there may, it may pre present an inaccurate view of the Hispanic population as being low risk. But I think um, there's other reasons, in particular the fact that there's no granularity in that data that I just presented in the other slide. So we can't really see whether this type of um, supposed health advantage applies to different aspects of cardiovascular disease. Does it apply to heart failure the same? Does it apply to um, cardiac arrhythmias or cardiomyopathies the same way that it applies to ischemic heart disease? We don't know. We don't have that granularity uh, yet. Um, we also don't know whether it's applicable across all Hispanic groups. Um, I mentioned about the heterogeneity of the Hispanic population, and I'll talk a little bit more about that, but we don't have the granularity to say whether um, what we see in the general data applies to every Hispanic group. I mentioned that a lot of the prior data was basically based on Mexican Americans and extrapolating it to everybody, but it doesn't really fit. The data uh, from Mexican Americans doesn't really fit my Dominican population. You, you got to look at these differences, and we don't know whether this supposed health advantage will bear out among the totality of the Hispanic population. And then there's issues of acculturation and socioeconomic status that have not really been investigated with regard to, to this paradox. So in my mind, there's equipose. This paradox is completely in equipose. You have some studies supporting it, some studies refuting it, and you have also investigators like myself, investigators in Hispanic health and Hispanic cardiovascular health kind of falling on one side of the fence or the other. But I think that we need, we need more data. We, need to, we still need to keep our focus on the Hispanic uh, community and understand the complexities uh, that, that are within this population that we still need to explore. Um, and, and part of that is the geographic diversity within the Hispanic community. Hispanic communities is, is really diverse. There's about 31 countries in Latin America, and that diversity is represented in the U.S. Hispanic population. Yes, most of the U.S. Hispanic population is of Mexican background, but a significant proportion does come from the Caribbean, specifically Cuba, Puerto Rico, the Dominican Republic, and then also Central and South America. And, and those data on those populations also needs to be um, borne out. There's also significant racial and genetic diversity in the Hispanic population. Uh, being Hispanic is not a race, it is an ethnicity. So you can have Hispanics from many different races. Hispanics that look like me, Hispanics that look much more European. Hispanics are definitely racially complex, and that's because of admixture and the admixed populations that has been going on for centuries in Latin America. So you have this varying proportions of West African, European, and Amerindian ancestry going on at being admixed for centuries. And when you look, this is uh, this study on, on your right, um, looked at this from a genetic perspective. If you start looking at the ancestral components, the racial ancestral components among different Hispanic groups, when you go from Hispanics of Mexican background they have more uh, European and African ancestry. And that's the blue and red um, that you see more, more here. Whereas as you start going to more Caribbean Hispanic populations, you start seeing much more green. Green is the African ancestry. You start seeing much more uh, predominance of African and European ancestry and less Amerindian ancestry. So this type of diversity 
in my mind, is really underappreciated when it comes to studies of the Hispanic population and studies of Hispanic cardiovascular risk. And, and the main example that I want to present with regards to that is with hypertension. Um, for myself, um, as I mentioned, being of Dominican background, I, re I recall as a medical student uh, and in training, always uh, reading in the medical literature how Hispanics were at a very low risk for high blood pressure, a risk that was actually very close to that seen in whites. And here I am looking at my Dominican community in Washington Heights, and I'm saying, <laughs> no way. You know, uh, we have a very high prevalence of hypertension. Okay, so what, what was going on? Well, at that time, data was being extrapolated from Mexican, um, Hispanics of Mexican backgrounds to other Hispanics. Once we had um, more, more representative data, and this is data uh, at the top figure from the study of Latinos. So um, we started breaking it down, and we actually do see that among Hispanics of Mexican background, they actually have the lowest prevalence of hypertension than any other Hispanic group, and that Hispanics of Caribbean background, Cubans, Puerto Ricans, Dominicans, have the highest prevalence of hypertension. So you can't paint everyone um, in the Latino community with one brush um, in, when it comes to cardiovascular risk. And actually, this was also um, highlighted in another study shown in the figure below saying that Hispanic blacks and Hispanic whites may have more similarity in hypertension prevalence to their non-Hispanic counterparts than to each other. So why do cardiovascular health disparities exist? I mean, this is very complex. It's been brought out um, by the prior speaker. Uh, this could be a much more complex uh, diagram than the list, the simple list that I have here. But these are just some of the things I'll touch upon, and that's the healthcare system uh, factors. There's some provider-related factors. There's some patient-level factors. Um, I, th I believe the patient-provider relationship is very important. It's something that um, has not been highlighted enough. And um, there's a very important uh, people uh, down at, at Johns Hopkins looking into, into this more, but I think it should be expanded more fully, and I'll talk about that. And then there's the environmental factors uh, that we now uh, really uh, give the label of social determinants uh, of health. So I'll start with some healthcare provider factors. There's implicit bias. Implicit bias is real. I mean, we all have it to some degree, okay? Um, I've, I've taken a test, and I, I mean, I have it. Um, we all have it, and, and we need to acknowledge it, and we need to acknowledge it in healthcare. Um, as providers. Uh, it's been shown in, in the literature that it exists, that it does influence um, how a healthcare provider either doles out uh, a diagnosis or doles out healthcare. Um, I've heard it in, from patients, African-American patients, uh, who tell me how they were either misdiagnosed or dismissed um, at some level. Um, so, so it's real, but I think it is becoming more increasingly recognized and appreciated. Um, there are some interventions that have been put in place. We have a study ongoing at Albert Einstein where we're trying to put in place interventions to recognize um, and to bring awareness to implicit bias among providers. So I think that, that um, it is important. And studies have shown that within uh, the healthcare system, types of inappropriate bias does um, um, does impact medical treatment and medical diagnosis. This, these are studies specifically among Hispanic communities, but showing that for Hispanics, they receive less cardiac medications um, at discharge. And, th and this was, these were Hispanics that came in with um, a diagnosis of uh, a heart problem. They left and were discharged with less cardiac medic medications than non-Hispanic whites. They received fewer cardiac procedures than non-Hispanic whites. So you see these disparities. Now, what's been sort of the, the criticism or the comment is that you can't really say whether some of this is really due to people having biases or is it just socioeconomic disadvantages, Hispanics, 
will be underinsured, only have Medicaid. Um, so what's, what's really going on? But we've looked in studies in the VA system. The VA system is supposed to take away access to care disparities because in the VA system, everybody is supposed to be treated basically equal when it comes to access to care. But even in the VA system, um, the studies have shown that in the VA system, white Americans undergo more, are more likely to undergo a cardiac procedure than um, uh, non-whites. So you still see some element of provider bias even when you eliminate access to care or insurance issues. So what I really think is going on is that you have the provider bias element that is augmented by the socioeconomic access to care under insurance disparities that, that we have in our, in our healthcare system. So when it comes, I, I mentioned the patient provider relationship, you have two sides of this equation. You have the provider and you have the patient. So the factors that influence this on the provider side is that many providers are not really sensitive to patients who are not like them. Okay, and, and unfortunately, much you see that uh, more in the, in the non-white uh, community where there's a lack of cultural, linguistically, or economically, economic sensitivity. And what that leads to, and this point was made before, what that leads to is a subconscious stereo, stereotyping where a patient may walk in through your door and you may say, this person is not, gonna, is not going to adhere to the medication or the treatment that I'm gonna recommend so why am I even going to mention it? So that, that goes on. And I hear it from patients, and I see it um, in, in providers. So I think it bears, it bears um, um, uh, mentioning. Then, but there's also pa patient factors that affect the provider, the patient-provider relationship. There's distrust um, um, in the healthcare system that patients can bring uh, into the clinic um, and into the relationship. There's uh, healthcare literacy issues that affect the communication that's going on, and there's obviously cultural and language barriers, and in the end, it leads to poor communication, which does affect the healthcare that's delivered. So it's not always just these outside factors. You also have factors between that are just human to human factors that we need to focus on and overcome. Now there's also mention of, of that there's biological differences among races that impact disparities. And yes, there's some few studies showing that there's some biological differences where um, there's a genetic, uh, there's a gene that can influence the sodium sensitive hypertension that I mentioned is more prevalent among African Americans. And that this gene is actually controls function in the kidney that promotes sodium reabsorption you know, and, and yes, there's some uh, data also suggesting that there's um, biological genetic differences in how African Americans may um, metabolize or process medications. And so that may influence disparities. This was borne out predominantly in the AHEF trial that's uh, shown in the figure here. And I, and I ag agree that, that there are some biological differences that should not be dismissed, but I think, I think it, there, they're, they're small, they've come out to be relatively minor. And I think we really have to, when it comes to the gene versus environment debate, we really have bigger environmental and societal issues to focus on um, before we start blaming it all on, on biology or biological differences among race ethnic groups. Um, I really think that you can't, it's not an all or none type of scenario. So in, in the study on, the, on, the, on, on your, your left, it's really an international study looking at people of different African origin. Um, um, people of African origin that lived in, in Nigeria versus people that live in, in Chicago, in the Chicago area. And what you see is that hypertension is multiplied three times from the person that lives in Nigeria to the person that lives in the Chicago area. So it's not all about biology. I mean, the environment has a lot to do with it. And 
Um, my, uh, this is study, a study that I published, study on the, on the right, showing that socioeconomic status was an independent determinant of left ventricular mass. So people of lower socioeconomic status had higher left ventricular mass. And yes, it is complex, but I think it's, it's not all or none. But I think the, the, the popular notion that, you know, genetics loads the gun, but in the environment ultimately pulls the trigger. Um, you, you, you have, and I think it shouldn't be looked at. We do a disservice when we try to look at only genetic differences. And, and we have to look at where the genetic differences are being manifested. What's the environment around it? So if you have genetic differences in an environment where there's um, high socioeconomic, uh, low socioeconomic stress, um, a high level of social determinants of, of health and adversity, you know, those, gene those genetic differences then really um, um, manifest. So we really, ha we really can't separate it, in my mind. Um, it's really ge uh, genetics augmenting the effect of environmental factors. So where, does, where do our challenges and opportunities lie? And uh, I'll end with just a few slides with this. Um, I think the first opportunity uh, comes with increasing access to care. I think a lot has been said about this um, by the previous speaker, which I, I, I agree with so much. And to me, it's not a political issue. I mean, it's, it, it's an economic issue. I mean, you, you, the prior speaker brought it out so well. And I, I have here a, a, an estimate of about $230 billion that can be saved if we just focus on health disparities, but I'm thinking mostly of the cardiovascular disparities. The estimate that was brought out before was in the trillions. So if we really focus on just eliminating disparities as a country, as a healthcare system, we would save so much money um, um, and reduce um, direct medical, medical care expenditures. So we also have um, a challenge and an opportunity in diversifying our healthcare workforce. And I believe that that needs to happen not just at the physician level. I mentioned how only 6% of, of physicians are black and Hispanic, despite blacks and Hispanics um, encompassing 30% of the population. But we have an opportunity now to really diversify the workforce by looking at nurse practitioners and increasing diversity in nurse practitioners, uh, physician assistants, um, nurses. There's just, the opportunity has now been increased. So we, you know, in the past it was, you know, we can't get all these people into med school. Well, that's no longer enough of an excuse. We can promote underrepresented racial and ethnic groups in, in, in non-physician provider roles, which have become very essential in our healthcare system. There's uh, the opportunity to improve patient provider communication. I really think that this is um, a gap that is underappreciated. I think that cultural sensitivity needs to be increased. Um, and I've seen it from when I did medical training where there was zero to now where there's some level of cultural sensitivity training in across medical schools. And I think it's great, but we need to expand it. It needs to be standardized. How every medical school does it is different. We need to have a level standard across the boards, not just a requirement for people to do it, but kind of a level standard of what we want to achieve. And I think it needs to be expanded to not just be in medical schools, but in physician assistant schools, in nurses schools, in um, um, uh, nurse practitioner schools. Um, so I, I think that's an important opportunity. Increasing health literacy is an important opportunity. We need to really uh, hide in that. And, and how we develop an intervention to impact that is very complex. But I think if we can impact that, we can really um, improve cardiovascular metrics in our, in our population. Um, there's also an opportunity in increasing knowledge and awareness of disparities. So I think that, and, and this is something that I had in, in the prior slide that I, I didn't mention. I think it was really um, eye-opening that in a study that surveyed 
uh, only cardiologists, it, it was shown that 30%, over 30% of cardiologists don't believe that any disparities exist. And there are so many cardiovascular health disparities to address, and this is such a huge problem. But you have a third of actual cardiologists don't believe that it exists. So we need to increase knowledge of awareness. And I, and I say definitely start with the healthcare providers, but let's also increase awareness among the communities. I mean, if, if African Americans and Caribbean Hispanics know that hypertension is so much more prevalent, maybe then there can be more of an emphasis, more of a program where they can get screened and treated more often. Um, so I think awareness of disparities, not just among the healthcare providers, but also among the communities affected is important. It's an important first step towards prevention. Another um, opportunity is to uh, strategies to, in, to engage underrepresented racial and ethnic group communities, um, to build trust, to help navigate the complexity of the healthcare system. I don't think we do that enough. Um, we just trust that people are going to show up at our door and you know they're going to know what to do and where to go and, and how to get the best, uh, how to make the most out of the health care that's there. But having uh, um, patient navigators can really make a difference, and I think it's, it's underappreciated. Um, so lastly, I think developing interventions that can be tailored towards uh, underrepresented racial and ethnic groups is, is an unappreciated opportunity. And I'm not just talking about um, um, medicines, but I mean interventions that can help change health behaviors, can help um, improve um, care implementation for disease prevention and disease treatment, and can help us get at uh, what are the factors that are really I influencing healthcare among um, underrepresented and disadvantaged community. Uh, and, and I think lastly, among the cardiovascular community, we talk about every year, whether it's in the American College of Cardiology or in the American Heart Association, how are we going to reduce cardiovascular disease mortality in the country? How are we going to do it? And then we start setting goals. Okay, we want to reduce cardiovascular disease mortality by 10%, by 20%, right? Because we want that, that decline to continue. But I think that there needs to be an awareness when we set these goals that until we improve the cardiovascular health of all Americans, we're going to be hitting a plateau. That, that, that curve is only going to go down so much. Um, our country is becoming much more diverse. And with the larger population, larger proportion of the US population being non-white, I think until we can address and eliminate uh, cardiovascular disease disparities, we will not get to um, our cardiovascular goals. And I want to end with that. Other questions? OK, you've got Thank you. I guess it's sort of more of a comment than a question, but I guess what I would add um, to your last slides, you know, I guess I have two concerns. Um, one is who benefits from having an inequitable system? Because that's one of the forces that you have to overcome. And uh, the other thing is, you know, a lot of this speaks to sort of compassion. Um, you know, I think we still have to fight a culture, uh, cultural attitudes about um, illness and um, uh, if, you know, people still think that it's, it's somehow you're, you deserve to be sick, like it's a reflection of your character, and you can play that out in a lot of different isms. Um, but I think you know you can you can see like how much uh, did that little boy in the cartoon in the prior um, presentation? How much did he dig his own hole? You know, and does he deserve it? Right. So how do you get how do you overcome those um, problems? And, and uh, uh, heightened awareness. Yeah, so um, you know, you you bring out the tough questions, um, which uh, I think I think our last speaker did an excellent job also highlighting that this is not an easy easy problem to fix. Um, when you think about who benefits, right? I mean, our, our healthcare system 
is, in my opinion, also too fragmented. It's too fragmented. Um, so I, before coming back to New York and, and being at Einstein, I left Washington Heights and went to North Carolina for eight years. How healthcare is done in the South is so different than how it's done here in New York. And you just mentioned the differences between upstate New York and the city. I mean, go to the South. I mean, I'm sure many of you know this, but it's completely different. Our healthcare is too fragmented. Who benefits? Hard, hard to say, but there are people benefiting who do not really have that population health, public health um, uh, motivation. Um, there's more of a you know profit margin type of motivation. So I think we really have to get at that in some way. Um, but but it, it's a complex. How we get to that is a complex solution because our healthcare has a history of being so fragmented. And that's what's made us unique from other countries where, um, as the last speaker mentioned, they can um, put less money into the healthcare system and still have better quality than what we have. Um, so how we get there is complicated. One aspect, one complicated aspect, you mentioned the, the, the patient and health behaviors. Um, this is something that I've seen, um, I've seen in um, communities here, but I've also saw a lot when I was in North Carolina. You know, some people, yeah, they'll, they'll take it like they deserve to be sick. Or, you know, that's just kind of how the cards that, you know, life has dealt them in their, in their environment. So there's, a, there's an aspect to empowering populations that needs to happen. That's part of this uh, disparities um, mitigation and disparities elimination that we need to get to. And you know that I think has to be weaved around whatever interventions we come up with. How do we? How does this intervention? How is it going to also empower the patient? Because when communities are empowered, they feel. I mean, we've seen it in more communities that don't have a disadvantage. They feel more of a right to come into the healthcare system and ask questions and demand care. If we do that to our um, disadvantaged communities and we empower them, then th there may be, and it's not going to happen overnight, but there may be an eventual change where you have them coming into a setting where they feel comfortable to ask questions, to um, really go into a discussion of what, what they can and cannot do to make their health care better and where they can ask for help and not feel that they're going to be dismissed. Um, so I think I think we have a ways to go, but but those are those are things that we really need to think about. Oh. Did I miss? Yes, sir. So. Thank you so much for this talk. Um, so I often wonder the role of stress and discrimination and the cumulative impact of stress. So. Um, Dr. Gerard talks a lot about um, adverse childhood events. So the first film that Dr. Levine showed us was a young man in Brownsville who was exposed to a trauma. He was held down, maybe at gunpoint, and this is an impact that may not be, we may not know about maybe until he's like 40 or 50 years old and he has hypertension. So when we talk about disparities, we, what I, we often don't talk about sort of the determinants of determinants, um, so we went from talking about disparities at the individual level, then we moved up to the social determinants, but there are determinants of the determinants. There's the racism and the discrimination that set up the social determinants, but we don't talk. So how do we address the sort of the more up, upstream determinants of the determinants? Yeah, we, so one of my um, research focus has, has been looking at uh, things like discrimination and how it affects cardiovascular outcomes, right? So we've published studies uh, in Hispanic populations as well as African American populations showing that discrimination um, does affect 24-hour blood pressure and outcomes uh, uh, among Hispanic populations and among um, African Americans. So I think it's, it's, it's real and there's, there's, you know, you, you talk about that stress but there's the stress of low socioeconomic status, of um, surviving a day-to-day, -day, 
of, um, you know, just, uh, yeah, figuring out how you're going to survive day to day of, you know, living, um, home instability, all kinds of, all kinds of issues that you're facing on a, on a day to day. And I think that those things do impact cardiovascular health and cardiovascular disparities. Um, how we get to uh, addressing those, you know, I, I, I think where, where I'm at now is part of, the, part of what we need to do is to show that, that the issues are real, that the issues are there, and that they're real. Because I'm still a little bit hung up on the fact that so many of my brethren won't even accept that they exist. Um, so I think that we need to, we need to ac acknowledge that they're real. We need to um, start with that at least. And then, you know, try to build around ways that, that we can um, eliminate them because it's really a societal thing that you're, that you're describing that needs to, a societal change that needs to happen, right? And we kind of taken a step backwards in my mind uh, uh, from that societal change happening and we kind of need to get back on course. Thank you so much.